So, uh, I maintain the the Linux perf tools, the tooling part, some some kind of work, but mostly the user space part. And uh, we do think about understanding a system by uh, looking at where things happen, like what code and what functions. And this talk is about doing it, looking at data structures instead of looking at uh, code. You're going to look at code as well, how code uses those data structures, but you're going to focus on the data structures. All different cache uh, computer architectures have ways for you to optimize um, access to memory, access to data structures. You have cache lines, you have a hierarchy, fast memory, registers, all sorts of components to optimize accessing, to batch things, to going to a higher levels of the uh, memory hierarchy. And because uh, as you go, it gets slower and slower and slower until it gets so slow that's memory. So why do we have to care? That, that's something that should be done by the compiler. The compiler should get the code and do the best thing with it. Uh, and and programmers in, in, in systems in, in systems like the in projects like the Linux kernel or other system software, they surely know better. They, they know how to pick the best data structure for each case and the best algorithm. So we shouldn't have to care. But the talk is about changing the distribution to, to, to get better performance. So what, what could get in the way of doing that? You cannot change data structures the way you change uh, code. At, at Plumbers, there were several talks about how for you to do profiling, get this information, and then uh, even after the, comp the, the code is generated by the compiler, you would get the blocks of a function that are the hot path and would move them together, move them around, get the, 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 the hot, hottest uh, parts of the code in the beginning so that when you access uh, memory to get the code, you're going to get only things that are going to be used and not things that may be used or are not so frequently used. That's okay. You, you can do it most of the time uh, with, with code. But with data structures, you have contracts. You have application binary interfaces where you have a compiled part and another compiled part, and if you change the thing, uh, there will be misunderstandings. It will fail to crash. There are ways for you to try to do some adjustments, like with BPF, compile once run everywhere, but that's not generally available. You have this contract of kernel with user space with sys calls and trace points, and they expect to have some sort of layout. And if it, this layout changes, things break. Uh, who can help me noticing these details? I mean, so let's take a look at one of these ABIs, glibc file struct. You have IO file, which you use with F close, F open, so on and so forth. And it was designed in the past in a 32-bit world. And uh, so you see that at the beginning of a very, uh, I mean, cr uh, critical work or uh, data structure that's used on the libc, you have four bytes that do nothing because of when it was designed 32 bits, the natural alignment for a pointer was four bytes. And now it's eight now for, for a long time already. So you, you the details you can see using tools like PHOLE uh, that will use debug information that the compilers put together um, with all those details. There are all sorts of caveats about how to use those data structures, but a tool like this can tell you what's the size, how many cache lines it uses, the number of members, all sorts of details that are going to help you in understanding, like doing uh, crash analysis, looking at memory, understanding what's there. The kernel. We can change non-exported structs, and we do it all the time. And 
there are parts of the kernel that gets in the way of what I'm going to dis discuss here. Like there are some data structures in the kernel that you say randomize the, the position of those those fields. Like task struct has a block of uh, fields that you can say to tell the compiler randomize when you are generating it, and, and that, that that gets in the way. But usually in the kernel you can change those non-exported struct, non-ABI structs, and rebuild. Unless you work for an enterprise distro, and then you have KABI, and you have limitations on what you can do, because you are establishing another kind of contract with some very special customers for those companies. Does it matter? If you look, if, if you, on, on a system today, if you have payhole installed, and if you are developing the kernel, you're going to have it. Uh, payhole task struct, it will get from BTF information, and at the end, you're going to see that it's a very large data structure. Uh, it has lots of stuff. There are lots of ways where space is being wasted inside it, because it has subtypes, and those subtypes have Paddings have alignments, uh, uh, holes in, 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 in the middle. Um, okay. Those are the districts over the years where carefully crafted by everybody in the kernel. You have a workload and then you want it to run faster. So you run and you say, oh, there's too much cache lines using something like perf or, and, and then you understand the code, you try you look at there, say what's causing these things, you know about false sharing, you know about uh, fields being related. So you over the years, the kind of community and other communities that care about this kind of thing went, went on and went moving things around manually so that those those cache line the cache effects are, are reduced and you get better performance. Uh, because if you have the related ones, one after the other, or the one that you call in a in a function, and then the the next one that's called in a function that's normally called from this first one, then you are priming the cache. You are getting things that are going to be used afterwards together. And and people have been using this. But if you if you do a git grab hole or git grab, let's say, last cache line, because sometimes the tool we use it is not uh, mentioned, you're going to see that it, it's it's not something that happened at some point in, uh, in time and then it stops happening. Uh, 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 this year, that's one case, Eric Dumas was moving things around to reduce the the size of struct TCP SOC. And they did a lot more. The, the Eric Dumas works for Google, and the, the the people at Google did work on making this grouping of of fields to be uh, easier to to perform, and to make sure that people afterwards will not mess with it. That if they change something on those data structures, there are build bug assertions that we will stop the build. If, if you mess with those cache line groups, it will stop the build. So if you do PAHOLE TCP SOC, which is one of them, you're going to see that there are several uh, cache line groups inside of this data structure. So uh, I'll, I'll describe how they do this. In the end, you're going to have uh, like metadata uh, created as fields inside of this data structure that have zero size and its name has this cache line group begun and then the name of the cache line group which is read tx or read txrx which becomes kind of obvious yes on the rx path you have a group of related fields on the rx tx you have another group and on tx you have another one so uh, you when you access the tx one you're going to bring a bunch of fields that are related to the transmission of, of a packet. So it's better for them to be together. They're going to be using less cache lines. The, the, the cache will be used more effectively. If you look how, how they how they make sure that this doesn't get screwed up. So they, they do this cache line assert group member. They say the name of the type, 
the name of the group, and the, and the field. And so this is one group. Yes, the TX read mostly hot path cache lines. And then they have this assert. So they do tricks with offset path, offset path and to make sure that those fields are inside the group. And if somebody adds something else, the, the size of the group will change. There, there are other markings to say the size of the group. And if you look at networking, cache line group begin, those were the, the, the files that uh, were changed. So they were interested in a particular path that involves a driver. That, that was a driver. I'm not saying it here, but, but yeah, that, that was a driver as well, an Intel uh, 200 gigabits uh, Ethernet driver. And the results, what does this mean? What does this results? This is from the, the, the message that was accepted, right? this, this work on the kernel. So you get 36% reduction for some use case, 41% for another one. So it seems to, to, to matter a lot for, for some of those high speed uh, cases. More results. So for 200 gigabits NIC and 150 megabytes L3 cache. Problem solved? I mean, we had carefully and manually doing it, then manually doing it, but making sure that so, see if somebody changes, it gets detected. But there's, there's lots of experience needed in setting up those things and keeping it sane and uh, where uh, should the new field go and things like that. Then we get to what we are trying to do in Perf now. But that's a motivation from the developer that uh, was doing this work for Google. So basically, it summarizes what I've discussed so far in this talk. There is documentation. I mean, every, everything is well marked. And there are tripwires for when people do something bad. Then we get back to Pinhole, which is tooling that will try to help with this. So a long time ago, when I was uh, creating Pinhole, I was thinking, oh, I should not just detect the holes. I should uh, help in reorganizing it, do it for you, move things around, reduce the size of the, the district, make it packed, but while respecting alignment uh, rules. So you can make it packet, you can mark it, the district as packet, and then, but then you're going to have a performance impact because the access to, to those memories in some machines, you need to have some fixed ops and things like that. It, it moves fields to plug alignment holes, combines bit fields, shows you the steps, and makes the thing smaller. So if you do PA hole dash dash reorganize for task struct, it would say that with the current algorithm that bit rotted, you would save 80 bytes and one cache line. It would be smaller. But 80 is naive. It, it doesn't take into account lots of things that I've talked so far. It doesn't take into account cache line, uh, uh, if the cache line has fields that are related one to the other, it's just moving things around. So it has to respect uh, the alignment attributes. It has to respect those cache line group metadata that we have now. So when moving things together, it should, it, when moving things around, it should uh, move that, that uh, cache line group as a an unit and so on and so forth. Uh, you, you could combine, combine different cache line groups if they are of the same nature, let's say, maybe. But that, that's just a, a crude attempt to, at some point to, to helping, tooling helping with reorganizing the district. So we get to something which is new, it was merged in December 2023, and it is being developed actively, which is data type profiling. So Perf had Perfman and Perf C2C to help with this since 2015, 2017. I'm going to show some examples of what it, it does. Perfman was the first one. In Intel, you have a feature called PABS, and in PABS, you have a way for you to say to the processor, uh, Please uh, sam sample from time to time. It's it, it gonna not, not look at all the accesses to memory, 
writes or is, uh, loads or stores, it will, from time to time, take a look. Oh, th there is an axis. Is this axis taking more than that many CPU cycles? If it is, take a sample. Get lots of information about this event. The memory that's being accessed, the, the IP, the instruction pointer that accesses it, registers, lots of things. You, you could ask for a last branch hacker to see what, what was the seconds of basic blocks that got to that point. Um, and it works just like the other perf tools, like perf record and report. So you have perf man record, you run through your workload, you point to some specific process or to a C group or to one of CPU or to a workload that you start from, from the tool or so on and so forth. Yeah, it's the same experience. To record, let's say, you, you, let, let, let's just use some use case, very simple one. Drop the caches and do perf mem record find on a BT butterfly uh, file system uh, to dev new. So it recorded some data, some 19,000 samples. What did it record? So this is a hybrid machine, which is a complication now, but that, that's the notebook that I have. So there are some uh, boilerplate here, but it, it, uh, the, the part that's interesting is that the mem loads load latency 30 and I want precise events, that's it, or main stores. Uh, all those other events, dummy, or these main loads arcs are related to specificities of Intel and things like that. But the, the tool tries to hide this away from you. Then you do a report, perf mem report. What are you gonna see by default? So the sort order that was using was memory, symbol, DSO, and the, the symbol data address, what is it it is accessing. It, 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 it can't resolve everything. We are making it resolve more and more stuff, but let's say things that are load, uh, allocated from, from the Zap cache or something like that. There are all sorts of things that we are trying to do to get the type associated with the data. But you can see that, uh, there, that there is information here that was not available before, like you see GFIS lock, shadow timekeeper, and then there is the kind of memory access. Yeah, you have oh it went to memory or it went to the line field buffer, like from L1 to the rest of the cache hierarchy, combining loads to avoid requesting uh, the same cache line multiple times. So if you have a request and it's for cache line and it's outstanding, you get another one, same cache line. It's a hit there. You're gonna not emit a new request to to the slow L2 or L3 or etc. So and and also available you have that all the kinds of information you have. Uh, is if it's a snoop operation, if it's a TLB is involved, if it was a locked operation, uh, if it was blocked, the local ins uh, instruction latency and so on and so forth. And then you can do something like that. You can do this perf mem report and say that on that uh, workload that we recorded, most of the time the data structure were rightly nicely uh, organized because most of the hits were uh, on the L1. It, it's not L1. You see, it's just 10% of them uh, is on L1. It's getting from the first level. But most of them are getting from L2. So you can get this kind of information now. And you can combine when you are specifying the dash dash sort with any of the other uh, sort orders that perf has. You can see a TID or a P for a thread, for a, for a process, for a C group, for a, and you can do this hier hierarchically like we're going to see. So you say sort by the symbol and destruction latency. So the, B B the BTRFS being searched is the one that's causing more latency for instructions. Perf C2C, I'm gonna see more examples of those uh, later on. But Perf C2C uh, also has a record report, but it's ca oriented to cache lines. So it tries to sh to help you in identifying data structures that are, have, that are being constantly evicted from the cache. So you have, let's say it's for multi-threading, you have, multiple CPUs accessing the same cache line 
and one of them is writing, the other ones are reading. So w the one that's writing it, it's making the one that's reading all the time get it from memory because it's changing it. So it helps for you to to find those ca those cases and then you change the, the layout of the data structure, you run it again, or you run your benchmark, it, it improves it. Okay, so you solve the problem. There is documentation about using it in the kernel hacking uh, the documentation in the kernel. There is an article at LWN with several examples about how to use it. But it was not resolving types. It was telling you that it was on that line number here, line number there, the cache line was there, and then you look at the source code and you, oh, uh, that's the data search. So what we what is being done now is trying to to get information from the wharf and BTF as well. Uh, we are doing a disassembly of instructions. You get the IP, get to that function, get to that instruction, parse the the, the, the instruction. We use the perf annotate. We had perf annotate that you can navigate. You can do a perf top capital A. And then you see the source code, and you see the, the events that are taking place, uh, looking at the binary disassembled and the source code, and, and you see it. So we had part of what's needed to parse the, the disassembled instructions. Uh, it, it was interpreting just jumps and calls and read. So you, 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 in perfect notate, you can press enter on a jump, and it goes to destination. And if you press on a call, it goes to that function, and then you see now how that function is profiling, and if you press red, you go back, so you're navigating on your system, sampling it as you go. But then we, we wanted to parse more stuff, parse moves and subtractions and multiplications, operations that affect memory or that uh, read from memory. Since this started to be used for more and more stuff, there are more interest from contributors to help and in, enter this code. So annotate is getting better because we are not needing anymore to use object dump to disassemble and parse the output of, of the two. We can use this capstone library, which is from the security community. It does the disassembly for us more efficiently, etc. cetera. Uh, there is also, or was merged, for 6.12 uh, using the libllvm disassembler. So but all the things related to disassembly, ADDR to line, etc., should be much better now that are using more efficient uh, things. So it's it, this is all incremental uh, improvement to the annotate code. So everything that's done for the data profiling is helping with the annotation of, of code with the pre-existing thing. PowerPC, I was support, well, initial field supported recently. Um, so we are reusing it for data type profiling. So we parse more instructions. We are not parsing everything. So you're going to see that lots of things are resolved. Some of the stops are unknown. But as time goes by, we are seeing more and more of how memory is being, and the data structures are being used. It just plugs into the perf workflow. You, you have more keys to do sorting. In addition to CPU, Cgroup, PID, etc., you're going to have the type and the type of set. And the type could be a data structure, task struct, let's say, or inode, or something else. Or it could be a kind of access, let's say, a stack operations. So if you have f a function that's called many times, there will be lots of accesses to memory when you are doing Kali saving of registers that you're going to use on, a, on your function. So there's going to be a prolog to your, to your function and an epilogue where you are getting the, the values that are in registers that you are going to, to, to clobber, to, to use, to the stack, which is memory. So it, this is sampled as well. And type off, you're going to get the offset and the field name if it managed to resolve it. So that's the on one example. So 
for that find thing, 18.41% uh, of the memory access that it managed to, to resolve were for stack operations. So perhaps we should get one of those functions and inline it uh, so that those operations will not happen. So you, you see the other types with the percentages. So the the sort was the period, uh, the number of sample, and, and the type. But we can go on and do type symbol. So you go from BTRFS key, but in that function, that's the function that's using it the most, and so on and so forth. Or type symbol, source file, and source line. Then you go to the, to the, and this is already a source file, source line, which was a really slow operation because it was parsing the output of tons of calls to uh, edit the binary ADDR to line. Now it's done with lib LLVM, so it's much, much faster. Uh, you don't have to wait too much. So you see, it's just combining the things that we already had, the concepts that we already had in, in Perf, but with type and symbol uh, added to the. And you can go and say hierarchically now, show me the data structures. And inside of the data structures, what are the fields that are mostly used? So you go, uh, a struct I know most of the time is that ISB, and then, then the read count counter, and then the I security, and then the flags. You can do using on um, hierarchy as well. So. BTRFS, 15.35% 15, 15 of the time is BTRFS key. Of those 15%, 7% is for uh, 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 for the key, to the key plus zero, the, the, because we are, and then you see the, the object ID, and inside of the object ID, you see the, the other, really, or I'm interpreting more. Or you can do with the, the type plus the memory. So struct I know is mostly coming from the line view buffer and then from run and then not. And struct D entry. So you, you can't go on combining those things like you did with other uh, fields or other sort orders. You can ask for the cache line as well, like type CLN. Uh, so it, it says that 1.23% uh, was a second cache line and then the fourth cache line, the sixth cache line. And then you uh, unfolding the this uh, struct CFS hierarchy cache line zero, you see what's what are the fields inside of this cache line zero that are being accessed. You have support as well in cache in perf annotate. So you, you have dash dash data type. So you're gonna show the data structure and then the percentages of access for memory loads that took more than 30 cycles, that was the distribution. And we can see that this is packed because the alignment of offset is not that uh, a multiple of eight bytes. Lemyung added support to debug this thing. So if you think something is wrong, you do dash dash uh, debug type profile and it will tell what are the steps that have been performed what the, what the, to get to this resolution so that you can help if something is, you think that something is fishy, is not working, so we can debug by looking at what are the steps that is being performed in the resolution of time. It's the kind of information that you get there. Sometimes you don't find the variable, but you get all the way to some point and you can go back and try with source file and the source line number and then help uh, improving this, this algorithm of resolution. It was an example with BPF map, uh, another annotation of the type and then the percentage of set size and then the structure. What we are now thinking about doing is uh, the next step, which is to find siblings. Let's say you 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 get the sample for memory access, and then you go to to 
to, to, to the code that is existing and it will resolve to the data type. And then you resolve to the data offset from the instruction, you have the register that you resolve it to a type, let's say it's the first argument for the function, and then you have a displacement, which is the field. So you look around on the same basic block uh, for accesses to the same register with a different displacement, which means another field. Then you go on listing all those fields, which is a set of fields that are accessed together with that one. And then you have these into, uh, and you resolve also the type of operation. If you are writing or reading, this is not from a sample. This is from disassembling the, and looking around that instruction that causes the sample. And, and, and you get those, uh, uh, those accesses should be on the same cache line if, you, if you, they are of the same type. So this is, this is trying to, to do the work that the people have been doing so far in an automated way. Uh, instead of requiring that you know about this, read the source code, look at all those things, you get help from the processor for the samples. And then you get help from this assembler, and then you, you get those things, and then you organize, and then you get this to the developer that will look at and, and try to, to change those things. We should have a sort order, field symbols, and then you're going to combine them with all the things, trying to find those relations. And we should provide output. Uh, that's consumable by other tools that, let's say, behold, that naive thing. Now we're going to get this information and all the all this information for about alignment, cache line groups, and etc. Put this together in a solver and reorganize the thing. Uh, now, in a non naive way. And rebuild and then profile again. In Pihole and BPF2 as well, we, we can get uh, debugging information, DOR or BTF, and say, regenerate this data structure in a way that is buildable, that's compilable. The, the, the BPF compiler once run everywhere, uses that when you are building a BPF bytecode that uses types. So you have a VM Linux that's generated from the BTF information for the kernel. So we, th this is technology that we have already, and we should use in, in other ways. But then the end result should be something for data that we are not we are experimenting for quite a while with code. So there are, there are interest uh, uh, in, in lots of places in in having a way to heavily optimize uh, post compiling. The, the code, and if we could do that as well with data, and then generate a kernel that is specific for some specific workload, which is like for a tailored for, for that specific workload, maybe we can get automatically uh, gains like the ones that were found manually by the Google guys. We need to experiment with that to see if, if this, this would be feasible. And we can as well use this just for avoiding regressions. We could just keep this on a CI and see if, if this data structures are changing uh, to, to, to make sure that we don't regress to, to, so that we don't have to, to keep those pro profiler uh, groups uh, manually for, in all cases. It's too much work. And, and this, uh, the other idea after that is to use Albier to look at not just basic blocks inside a single function, but to look at the most common code paths that spans multiple functions. So we can ask for, let's say, the last 32 recent hardware, I think 32, some, some new hardware is getting it deeper, so that we could look at the most frequent call path and then try to get those fields together based on inter uh, functions, interactions. And that's it. That's what I had to say. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. And if you have questions, I, I will try to answer them.
Yeah, Arnaldo. So how does Rust fit into all of this? Is there any plan? Uh, the f <laughs> I mean, take a look. Uh, as I was talking with you, the support yeah. that Behold has for Rust, it has support for Rust already, Behold. It's uh, uh, dash dash exclude lang. When you are building BTF as part of the kernel build process, it fits from Rust. Forget about it. Don't look at it. Because we can't, uh, so far, that there are difficulties in understanding what, how to represent the, the data structures in Rust to, uh, in, in, into BTF. So there were discussions at, at, at Plumbers about, no, we have to get the realized types, which was the concept for Rust when interacting with C. And, but there are namespace. Oh, we have to flatten them. We have to get. But then it's going to be really large, and there are limitations for the size of uh, uh, symbols inside the graph. So there is discussion. The, another problem I have with PA hole that I have to solve when I get back to Brazil is that there is a report that when you are doing a kernel build using Clang and thin link time optimization, it combines Dwarf from Rust and from C into the same compile unit, and then Pahol gets confused. So uh, that's something else that I have to, 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 to look at. But yes, we, we have been talking here and there. Uh, and uh, as these conferences go, we exchange more information. I'm not especially in Rust. I don't know Rust. But I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get information about the part that's related to BTF, to PA hole, to, to, to those things, so for, for profiling. There is support for the Rust demangler in, in Perf, and for OCaml, and for Go, and for several other things. So if you have something that's not working with Perf or Hole or all the things that I talk about here, I, I would like to hear and then try to move. Hey, thanks for the great talk. What's the typical uh, size of a cache line? A 64 bytes. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, I see that you're taking a profiling approach here, uh, which is great, but I wonder, so once you're narrowing down on a given data structure, it looks like what you're really interested about is not only uh, where the memory access ends up. Yeah, when. What's the order? What's the pattern, exactly. right? Yeah. So I was thinking about, well, have you considered, uh, let's say, allocating the... Uh, data in such a way that it would trigger faults on every access, and then you could follow with the state machine what happens for every single field access right, but, and but then this, the relationship. But, but, but what we try with Perf is to try to do this in production. Let's say we, without generating... Uh, for development, it's yes. interesting. That yes. would be like a Valgrind uh, approach or something exactly. like that. That, that. that would be nice, and, uh, and I hope that it, it's something that worth pursuing, but that's not the, the approach that we are trying with Perf. We are trying to, with Perf, uh, it's to do something like F-Trace does. It's to, to do this in production. To, uh, oh, something's not working. Let me collect some uh, low impact data and then try to do as best as we can without Im yep. impacting the... So, so, but it looks that, like for the development use case, there would right. be a value for something that's sure. a bit more heavyweight. Sure, 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 sure. Because the, 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 the potential impacts are, are, are huge. So speaking of the profiling, what is the um, impact of using the PEBS for tracing? Well, that's a good question. Uh, the, the, this is a facility that is inside of the, the processor. So it's not something like, uh, it's something that has dedicated circuitry for it. Uh, I don't have numbers on top of my head. Uh, I would have to, to do some research to, to get, but this is low impact. And, and, and it depends as well in how much data. I mean, you can, you can say when this happens, you collect that much information or a little bit less or with a higher frequency or lower frequency and so on and so forth. That if you would let something like Intel PT uh, processor trace to say all the branches, all, all, and lots of other information, I mean, it's, it's gigabytes and gigabytes of information every second. So, yeah, you, you have to tune this, but uh, for... That, that LD uh, latency uh, uh, and the frequency uh, it combine, uh, allows you to measure the impact and then go on reducing iteratively mm -hmm. so that you get something that is okay and uh, 
will get you, get you the information that you want without impacting too much the, the workload that's being observed. Great. Thank This information that you get from parsing uh, this assembly, do you think it would be useful to actually get it added into Dwarf so you don't have to disassemble and instead you just use debug information? And yeah. like actually what kind of information you're trying to get and like whether it's possible to to somehow represent it in, you know, in compact form in Dwarf. Nemyun, that's the one that's actually coding this. Uh, the, the, this more recent thing on the type of problem solving this, he gave a talk at, uh, at Plumbers where he says that uh, Clang, for instance, has a, a flag, compiler flag, that adds more information for, for, for profiling that helps with us. There, there are some discussions about shortcomings that Dwarf has and bugs sometimes and extra things that they could. Uh, his talk was about that, trying to get more information from BTF yeah, let's say for uh, static variables, it would be nice. There is work being done on that so that you could get the type for the, uh, not to require dwarf. But that th this is like a trade-off. Eh? Oh, dwarf, we don't want to use dwarf because it's too verbose. But now I want some more information on it. Uh, we want to use BTF, but since I'm using BTF, I want some more information and so on and so forth. So th there are efforts in the compiler people to make this easier. Okay. And uh, we are constantly looking at what's happening and trying to communicate our needs, and people are listening. OK, thank you. The, the good thing with this, with this presentation, et cetera, is, is that we, we, there is a missing part, which is developers trying to use this more frequently and reporting results and solving problems, or telling that it's crap, it takes a long time, it's not working, or that doesn't match my expectation, and check it and it's not working really. Uh, we have to have some sort of validation from people who know what to expect and can validate that. And then people who are the experts on doing this thing manually, if they use this and say, oh, it saves me time, that would be the best uh, uh, help that we could get. Um, you, you, you've talked about PEBS, which is Intel. Yeah. Um, IMD, if I'm not mistaken, is like IBS or something like that. Yeah, IBS as yeah. well, uh, AMD. Are there main differences between those two? I, I, I don't have a precise answer okay. for that. There are limitations in IBS. IBS mm -hmm. allows you to do some stuff mm -hmm. and, and not that you can do with, uh, that you can do with PEBS. Like AMD doesn't have Intel PT, uh, but the developers that are the specialists on, on this area, they are trying to get what is possible to do with them mm -hmm. and uh, use it with perf C2C, perf mem, and data type profiling. So PowerPC has facilities for that as well, and surely there are difference, and I don't have them on the top of my mind. But the interesting thing is that, that there is value being perceived by those people, and they are trying to get what's possible to do with AMD uh, uh, working with this. And the same thing for okay. PowerPC and ARM. And ARM, I think, uses core site, which is a different way, a facility, hardware facility that's present on some machines and not others. So, but yeah, the tools tries to, the community tries to make the tools hide these differences and provide a unified experience. Yeah, actually the question was more about, as of today, what are the implementation, implementation gap between uh, Intel and AMD mostly? Yeah, yeah. But, okay, thank you. Because there, there's a, the Perf has a big uh, set of contributors, and then it works with lots of really uh, interesting concepts. And so we, we need to have specialists in this area, in that other area, and so on and so forth, trying to work together to get something which is consistent. Any other questions? So thank you for being here.